thing pending following this, uh, that's good too. So um, with that in mind, really the, the intent is not to really be a deep dive into any one thing, but just kind of to help you feel more comfortable if R is something you'd like to learn, because my personal experience is that what, peop what keeps people out of, of using R and other kind of code-based um, analysis options is really a little bit of fear and just being overwhelmed at the beginning. And so I think if you can get by this um, sort of activation energy, you'll find there's a lot to gain from diving right in. Um, so without further ado, um, sorry, my slide doesn't seem to want to advance here. Um, I guess I have to click down here. So um, R is a computer language. Um, it was developed in the 90s. So it actually historically, there was a commercial and open source language actually um, called S and S plus. And so these guys thought like, well, R comes before S, let's name it R. So it's a bit of a cheeky name. Um, and it developed as a language for statistical analysis. So um, it's not like, you know, it has similarities to, but things like Python or C++ um, didn't really arise for the need to do statistics. So the fact that R did arise in this framework is still really its main strength because I think it's probably still the best came in town if you have to do a lot of stats. Um, but other languages do have more strength. So um, there's faster and more powerful, more flexible languages. But um, if you want to do stats at the end of the day, I think it's worthy worth your time to invest in R a little bit. Um, it also has a bioconductor branch that's focused more explicitly on bioinformatics. So often if you read a paper, somebody will talk about a bioconductor package this or bioconductor package this, that, and they're really talking about R. Um, it's just sort of hosted on their bioconductor branch. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in subsequent slides here. Um, so first off, like why should you learn R? Because frankly, you know, it, it will take some work if you if you want to really take full advantage of this. Um, and probably the, the main reason people do is that their project, whatever they're working on, require like a degree of analysis that can only really be done um, sort of in R or similar script-based uh, methodology. Um, but also if you just like solving puzzles, I, I really enjoy actually still after all these years when I get a new data set, sort of taking it apart um, piece by piece in R and uh, trying to figure out what's going on there. And a lot of people I, I hear really like this as well. Um, I would say it has access to a, a very large suite of methods. Um, so different things you might wanna do with your data. And most of these, if not, well, I won't say all, but many of them are released by really the top people in their respective fields. So um, you'll read many papers you know, that will come out and that's where you can get the algorithm that this researcher developed is you need to go into R and you need to install um, what would be called a package that contains those algorithms and then you can run with them. Uh, and also methods are open source. So what this means is that they're free. Um, you don't have to pay for them, which I think is important to a lot of people um, for equity and science. Um, they're auditable, so you can actually see what they're doing under the hood if you ever want to. And they're expandable, so you can build on them, so you can take one method and funnel it into other methods as you need to. And so collectively, um, I'm a big proponent of open source software because I think these are all really important things for science. Um, whereas other stats programs, for instance, that you might buy, if you want to really get under the hood, um, I think it can be much harder. Um, and it also opens when you start to learn to code a bit, a doorway to a large suite of skills and languages. So it's really a fusion of computer science stats and of course the biology that drives the questions we want to ask. And so you see a lot of people go from R into other languages like Python or Java or whatever they might need for other projects, but it's sort of a gateway language for a lot of people um, coming at this from the biology side, which I think is great. Um, there's also some good reasons not to learn it. Um, it's got a steep learning curve. Um, there's no getting around that. You're learning a new language and it just takes time. And so if you do choose to learn this, just be patient with yourself and recognize that you're going to struggle at times um, and it's going to seem really difficult at times, but hopefully the payoff in the end is worth it um, and you can advance quickly enough that you still get a lot of satisfaction from it. So it can take a while. And um, if you don't keep using it, you're gonna also forget it. So if you just wanna learn R for one little piece of a project and then never use it again, then maybe um, you should look for somebody to help you with this and not try to do it um, yourself and try something else. Cause many things are gonna be easier with a commercial package like SPSS or Prism Genius if you're doing sequence editing Excel if you're just doing data sheet manipulation, you know? Um, and it's still true, like I'm not using R for everything. You can do almost anything you want um, with R these days, but it's not often, or it's not always the best solution. Uh, and then as the corollary of, of this being kind of the gateway to a lot of different languages, um, a lot of times people tell me that, well, they want to learn R, but what if maybe they should actually be learning Python? Um, so then because of that, they can't decide and they don't actually learn either. 
So I think that's a little too bad because the good news is that if you learn one language, um, the next language you learn is going to be easier and easier. So if you're kind of at, on the fence of being like, oh, well, I like the idea of R, but I really want Python too. Um, I think you gain a lot by learning them both, you know, so don't, don't just wait until you know the exact perfect language for you. Just get started and have some fun with it. And I think the rest will um, follow from there. Okay, so how does R compare to other options? Um, again, um, as this is an intro, I'll just over, do a quick overview. So as I said, you're not gonna get much easier to use than sort of more limited domain applications that do possibly fewer things. And you can have like a GUI or a GUI that you, so you can point and click on things to do things because there's not a lot of that in R. So if you're just about the easiest solution, um, this probably isn't for you. But if you want more flexibility, if you want the ability to cope with bigger data sets um, or like do high throughput analyses where you're looping through a lot of different data sets to glean information, if you want like the state of the art methods as they're being released, um, and if you want reproducible analyses, I think these are all important things that you should think about learning R to undertake. Um, but do remember, and I already said this, it's not the best tool for every application and it doesn't try to be. So if you're trying to do everything with R at the same time, you're probably gonna end up pretty frustrated. Um, so for instance, this is just a template uh, presentation. I was considering putting this together in R just as an example of how great it was. Um, and then I realized I was just gonna waste a whole bunch of time coding this when I can just use PowerPoint, which has decades of uh, you know work that's made it very easy to make presentations in. So not to say you shouldn't do this, but um, not everything is, is meant to be done with R. So keep that in mind too, and cut yourself a break if you're trying to do something um, and you just can't make it work in R, then maybe do it in Excel for a little while and help yourself out. Okay, um, any questions so far? I'll keep going maybe into a little, a little bit more nitty gritty here. So the first thing you need um, to use R is an installation of R. So it's just a program you can download um, and you can download it at this uh, website called uh, CRAN or CRAN, um, which is the Comprehensive R Archive Network. So there's links at the end of the presentation. Um, so you just go there and basically click and download the version um, that suits your operating system. So I usually use a Mac. So this is the Mac version that I've opened up here. And when you open it, you see this thing called the console, um, which I've labeled the console here. And then you can go up to the file menu, which um, I don't have open here, but uh, we could do this later if there's time and you can make a new script and then you have a script editor. And so this is important because the console is sort of um, like the command line where your operations are being executed. And the script editor is where you're gonna write down all your commands and then save them for later or save them so you can run them all at once when you're ready to actually like execute your full analysis. So you should always be using a script editor and um, saving the commands that you run and trying to write things in sort of a, a linear manner such that you could run the script from top to bottom and execute your series of commands. And so a lot of people um, don't actually know this off the bat. So you will need an R install to get started, but I would also really recommend uh, for people getting started is R Studio. So R Studio is what they call an IDE or integrated development environment for R. Um, and so the idea is it just makes everything about R easier. Um, and it does that in a bunch of ways, which I'll go over in a minute. And so you can just go to rstudio.com. And once you have R installed, you can then download the version of R Studio, get that installed. And then the first time you open it, you should see something like this. Your colors might be a bit different, but um, basically it's taken taken R and sort of packaged it into a few um, frames for you within a window. So here we have where the script editor will normally go, although this can all be changed. So same as we saw before, this is where you'd save your scripts. This is the console down here. So this is where things get run when you type them in and, and click execute. Um, and then it's got some other windows that can help you out here. So if you render a plot, so you make like a, a plot of your data that will pop up over here, or if you look for help, um, that will pop up under this tab here, or if you want to look at which packages you have installed, that will pop up over here. And then you can see some other things in here. And so we'll, we'll get to this a little bit more in the future of the presentation, but this is sort of an overview of what you'll see when you open this up. So um, it does have a lot of useful features, and I think these are particularly powerful for uh, people who are just learning. Like, um, and um, one of these is tab auto completion. So you may not be that familiar with this if you don't code a lot, but what this means is you can start typing something and you can hit tab and it will search for things that match what you've been typing to help you finish it. Uh, this is really important, I think, when you're learning to code because a lot of times it, 
there's a big issue is just like remembering the name of the function or the specific way it's spelt. Um, or if the person who wrote this function used periods or underscores when they wrote it, like that stuff's hard to remember. Um, so if you can just start typing and hit tab and it shows you what your options are, that's really helpful. Um, your plots that you make all get archived or saved so you can kind of scroll back through them. Um, a lot of common commands do have point and click options. So if you just started out with what we would call like base R, um, with that first window I showed you, uh, you basically have to code everything you want R to do. Now R Studio helps you a bit by allowing you to click on some things. And then the last, but there's still a lot more important things I think, um, about this is it that's integrated with Markdown. So um, this provides a nice way to embed your code and your outputs in nice documents that you can share with people. Um, and they look pretty professional, I think, once you do this. It's also good for reproducible analyses because you can just do your analysis and then you can make a Markdown document of that analysis and share it with people and they can see exactly what you did and how you did it. So I won't go to it right now, but you can go to this link if you want and you can see some examples of different um, what what things you can do in Markdown, what they look like. And um, I think it's a pretty easy way to make pretty professional looking reports for sharing with people and um, a really nice feature. Um, and you can do this without our studio, but it definitely makes it easier. So I'd say that's important. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit more about these packages and libraries. So am I going too fast for anyone? Is this making sense? Um, okay, I'll just keep going. Um, it's always weird giving a presentation in, in uh, Zoom or something. I just feel like I'm talking at my computer here, but that's all good. Um, so when developers make new kind of functions, functionality for R, um, they typically release them as what are called packages. Um, and these are also called libraries, uh, which is slightly confusing, but not too bad. Um, and so if you, you know, read about some function in some paper that you want to apply, um, but it didn't come um, with your base install of R, then you probably need to go track down the, the package that that function is in. Um, so you need to install these packages um, so that R can find their pieces to do things. And these things that it's going to do are executed via the functions that are in the package. So these are like the programs that come all packaged up in a, a broader package that you'll get. Um, and it's pretty easy to find packages. Um, there's only really three places where they're kept. One is at, at CRAN here where you, you can just use some built-in R functionality to download these packages. Um, there's also packages hosted on Bioconductor, so these tend to be the more bioinformatics type of packages. And then if somebody is actively developing a package and they have said, okay, this isn't quite done, but you know, like we want the community to be able to use this, they often host it somewhere like GitHub. And then there's also functions that can allow you to just download these um, packages from GitHub. So those are the three main places where packages are stored. Um, and I'll show you some examples of those hopefully um, in a little bit here. Okay. So um, once we've got this all up and running, um, I want to talk a little bit about what you'll then do in R. And again, like we'll take this into R if we have time at the end. So it should be a little more clear, but I just want to give you an overview first. So in R, we call the programs that R is using to do things functions. Um, and you can recognize a function because it's going to be um, some word that then has uh, round brackets after it. Um, and then within those round brackets, you will see something entered. So here, um, down here in the third line down is an example of a function. Um, and here's an example of a function. So we have the function mean and we have the function C and I'll talk about these a little bit more. Um, once you do something with these functions, you often want to save those things somewhere. And so in R, um, we make objects, we call them, and we assign things to them. Um, so um, here, I'm just showing where the command prompt would be in red here. So for instance, what we're saying here is, let's make an object called X and assign it the value five. So we use this kind of weird um, beak, this uh, less than and dash to make an arrow. So saying make X five. Um, you can actually do the same thing with the equal sign here. These are totally the same um, in terms of how they're evaluated by R. Um, and so often you see people who come to R from like Python or something will use this, or people who learn in R will use this typically. So um, really the same thing. So don't be confused by that. Um, in this case, we can assign other things, um, pretty much anything we want to objects. So here we can make X, um, this string of numbers, zero, one, two, three. And so 
to make that string, what I'm doing is I'm using the function concatenate, which sort of confusingly is just short for concatenate is C. So I'm running the function C on 0, 1, 2, 3 to make uh, something called X. Uh, all right, so we might not want to call everything X. And if you were to run these in order in an R session, it would overwrite X each time. So first you'd get X is 5, X is 5, and then X after this would be 0, 1, 2, 3. Um, we can do other things, for instance. Um, we could make something we want to call the mean of X because um, we want to compute it and we want to remember what it actually was. And then we run the function mean on something like X. So if we were just running this in order, X would be 0, 1, 2, 3. So we would assign to mean of X the um, mean of these numbers here. So I hope that's not too complicated, um, but that's sort of the very basic syntax that you need to kind of start using R. Um, so just to outline this a little bit more detail, so as I said already, these are equivalent. Um, C here is sort of confusingly actually a function, short for concatenate, and it creates an object that holds these elements. Um, here, X is an argument that we're using um, mean, the function mean on, and then we're saving that output of the mean in this object we've called mean x. So I know it's a little bit of jargon, but hopefully um, everybody was able to follow that. Okay, so in addition to using functions that uh, come along with R and packages, we can write our own functions. So here we can make a function that we call mean two. And um, one thing you don't wanna do is make new functions that are named the same thing as old functions, because that's pretty confusing. Um, you don't want to run mean and actually get something else that you overwrote it with. And so here we're just saying that um, we're going to make a function that takes x and uh, evaluates the sum of x's over how many x's there are, so the number of x's. So this you should recognize is just the arithmetic mean of the x. And so then we could run that if we wanted. So this is just to show you a little bit here. Um, I think writing functions is a few steps down the road for people learning R, but I just want to show you that this is something that you can do pretty easily. Um, and you shouldn't be scared off by it because it's, it's still pretty simple. Okay, so if you do have a function um, and you um, aren't sure what it does or how to use it, you can use the function help on that function and it will return its help menu for you. Um, sometimes these help menus are quite opaque um, if you're not used to reading them. Um, because they're written by you know people who know R really well on average, so they, they don't make it super easy for new people to understand sometimes. Or you can also just type question mark mean, which is a shortcut for this help mean. So these are two ways, if you have a function and you're interested about what it's doing and how to use it, this is where you would start, and also um, start by Googling it or um, looking on sort of an intro to R webpage. Um, I mean, we only have an hour today, so I, I will, I'll go through some of this stuff, but I won't be able to get through all of it in R. Okay, so, um, showing you a little bit here about what this looks like in practice. Um, so when you start up a, a uh, I would call it an instance of R, um, some functions are already included. Um, other ones you won't be able to use, as I said, until you install their packages that they come in. Um, so we'll do this in a minute, but just for now, if this is my script window, um, I can just use this install.packages function um, here, I would type it in here, and then I would type the name of the package that I wanted it to find. Um, in this case, say we want to install dev tools, um, which is the sort for development tools, which helps you do more things with R. Um, and then I would just hit enter, and providing you have an internet connection, it should start to install this and all of its dependencies. So dependencies are other packages that a package requires to run. Um, and so we could install DevTools that way. We could install um, Bioconductor Manager that way if we want to manage Bioconductor packages. Um, and then once we've downloaded a package, things get a little bit more confusing because in order to use that package, we have to either tell R to look in a specific package for a function, or we have to load that library into what's called our environment. So just to show you what that looks like here, um, this code here, um, these two colons, when first time you see them, you might find them a bit confusing, but all this means is looking within whatever package you have here, run that function. So for instance, here I can say, okay, within the bioconductor manager, look for the function install, and then use that function to install bio strings. So um, 
I'm taking a bit of time here just because you know sometimes people get hung up at these initial steps, but I, I think they're not as confusing um, if you go through them a little bit. Um, the other option is you can use the library command or function to load all of the bioconductor manager packages into your environment, and then you will just install them um, with, um, you don't need to use these colons to access that install method anymore because um, you've already loaded the library. So typically what you'll do at the top of an R script is you'll declare all the libraries that you want to use, um, and then it just loads them in at the very beginning, you get it over with, and then um, you can use all the functions that you want to use for um, a session, and you don't have to worry too much about this um, once once everything's installed. So it may be that you can't, if you go to the library and it says, okay, the package isn't found, um, it may be that you haven't yet installed it, so you might have to go a step back and try installing it with this type of syntax. Um, or it may be that you're mistyping something. So one thing to keep in mind is that R in most programming languages, excuse me for a second here, are really pretty dumb. Like if you don't tell it exactly what you want, um, it's not really gonna find it most, most times. So like, for instance, you can see there's a few different mixes of the way um, things are written here. So here we've got a period for install. There's two words, install.packages, and they're separated by a period. Um, here we have two words, bioc manager, and they're written in what's called camel case. So the caps are changing. And so this is all kind of a pain to remember, like I said before. So that's why the tab completion really helps. But also, you know, when you do get an error that something's not being found, do go back and check that you're, you're typing it right because the case matters and um, different people write things differently. So, you know, here we have bio strings and instead of capitalizing the strings, they just left it small. So this all is a lot to remember. So that's part of the reason the tab completion is so nice. Um, so just go back and double check if, if R is not finding the things that you think it should find when you're doing these types of installs. Um, and so you can click here in your R Studio um, in window and it will show you whatever packages you have loaded. I didn't actually click on this when I took the screenshot, so it's still showing the plot window, but that's where you would click. So if you're not finding a function that you think you should have installed, um, click on that packages and just see if it is in fact installed or, um, or not, because you might, you might still have to install it. Okay, so a little bit more overview here. Um, as I said already, writing scripts is, is sort of important. Um, it's really good practice to save all of your work in scripts, um, even if they're not the cleanest or the prettiest or you're embarrassed to show them to people. I think that um, you know, you'll want a record of the commands you run, um, both for reproducibility and also so if you need to go back in six months um, and work on that data set again, you don't have to do everything from scratch. Um, so the script should be like a series of R commands that can be read, and these are executed in order by R. So you need to execute them or, or write them in the order that they're required for R to like reproduce the analysis. Um, you can't just write them in any which order um, because R will be looking for things that you've made early in, in the scripts that it won't be able to find. Um, and another nice thing about R is that these scripts can be executed interactively. So some languages you kind of have to write the script and then um, you know, tell the language to compile it and you only get an output when you've run the whole script, but you could run the little bits and pieces of the R script as you will. Um, and so kind of play with your data as, as it's going through this script that you've written for it. Um, the other thing about scripts is that you can write comments into the scripts and I'll show you what this looks like in a minute. Um, so I think it's always important, like when I started writing R scripts, I, I definitely didn't comment them enough because I'm like, oh, I'll remember what I did here. I just wrote this, but like, come back to that in a week, come back to that in a month, and you're gonna find that actually um, you were doing some sort of more complicated things that you thought you were, and you can't really understand why you did them at that moment. Um, so just to help your future self out, if not to help anybody else out, uh, use comments. So um, in R, we use this hashtag symbol to put that in front of a line that we wanna comment out, and then it won't be interpreted by R. So again, I'm gonna show you examples of this, so hopefully it makes a little more sense. So um, Here's our studio. This is the script we looked at earlier. You can see these lines I've got commented out. So here I said, okay, hashtag, this is a comment. Um, and so if I were to just run this whole script from start to finish, R would just ignore this. Um, and you should put in lots of them. So basically every, every time you're doing something that might need explanation, um, write what you're actually doing there because I know you'll appreciate it in the future and I know anybody you share your code with will really be grateful for that too. So past that, um, what we need to do 
to start using R is we need to get data into it. And this is the, actually the most often place I see, the most frequent place I see people sort of give up on R because if your data is at all weird and a lot of people who collect data um, aren't sort of thinking ahead to how it actually needs to be read by a program to analyze it. You guys may have had this experience um, with other projects. Um, it can be really hard to get data um, read into a program in the way that it needs to see it in order to do the analyses you want. So with RStudio, you can just go over to this import data set um, tab and you can read in from a text file, um, you can read in from an Excel file or SPSS, SAS, data, what have you. Um, I never really use these functions, um, mainly because I, I didn't come up kind of using RStudio. Um, so you can also just use a function like read.table to read in um, a data table um, in your code over here, which a lot of people do. And then that also means it's kind of nice because you can just run that script without actually ever having to interact with anything if you don't want to. So um, that's often, it's quite good. You can use these when you're learning, but I would suggest like once you've got this figured out, you can have your scripts actually read in the data that you want. Okay, so again, people often give up on reading their data in and that's for, um, kind of a few reasons that um, you should understand when you're getting started with R or with, with any language. Um, so when you save like an Excel sheet in XLS or what have you, um, that's not just a, a data table or just a, a spreadsheet. That's got a lot of like meta formatting in it that's, that's kind of providing that Excel functionality. And most programs won't like reading that. So if you try to read in an XLS, um, you're kind of asking for trouble right away. Um, R Studio and R in general now has better functionality for dealing with this, but it's often more convenient to keep your data in simpler formats that don't have associated things going on with them. And a common one that people use is a CSV file. So this stands for a comma separated variables, um, a text file. So these would be tab separated normally or things like a TSV, which is also tab separated variables. So if you're in Excel um, and you, there's lots of options for exporting your data, and you can choose CSV, you can choose all of these, I think, from Excel, and then you just use the appropriate function to read them into R, and that will save you a lot of headaches, I think, if you just keep the data in a very simple format. Um, avoid odd formatting. So you wanna try to have your data rectangular, and I'm gonna show you some examples of this in just um, the next slide. Um, so just keep the number of rows and columns in your data um, that you absolutely need, and don't be inserting extra things here and there, and again, I'll show you what that looks like. Um, and again, as I said earlier, um, most languages are really dumb. Like they, they'll only do exactly what you tell them. So if you one day decide that you're gonna put underscores in some of the names of your data sheets and some days you're gonna put dashes to separate words, um, you know, that's probably gonna come back and bite you. And I see this a lot because people will send me data sets that have been compiled by three or four people. And you know, person A decided they liked underscores and person B decided they liked dashes and C maybe like periods. And so all of this stuff um, just makes your life harder down the road than it really needs to be. So when you're doing this for yourself, you can choose these things and just, um, just be consistent with whatever you choose. Again, these can all be worked around, there's solutions to them, but um, as like somebody who's trying to learn R, you're just not gonna wanna deal with the errors and the bugs and things that you're gonna get when you're, when you're trying to import messy data. So to show you what that looks like a bit, like if we have this, this random sort of uh, experiment we've done where we might have looked at something across different days, we might have a few treatments and then we might have recorded some values. It really doesn't matter what. This is probably a poor experiment because it looks like we only did one rep of each combination of treatments. But anyway, this is gonna be really easy for R to read in because we have rectangular data. There's no ragged edges, it's nice and blocky. Um, all of the cells have things in them, which isn't a prerequisite, but it can help. Um, now, if you were kind of feeling a bit more adventuresome when you wrote down this data and you thought, oh, I'm gonna provide some notes to like help me interpret this down the road. And so you start annotating your data set with something like this, you know, whatever this means, I don't know, it doesn't really matter. But now suddenly what you've done is you've thrown a character into this numeric column with the star and now R is gonna see this totally differently than it does something that's all numbers. Now you've got an extra column and an extra row just to hold this note. And then if you were really sort of feeling adventurous, you might have added even more notes. So now that your top column or your top row is no longer like the headers in your columns, you've got sort of metadata up here. So again, you can deal with all this in R like if you wanna read it in, but if you start as a beginner 
trying to read something like this in, you're just going to have a lot of difficulty and be really frustrated and, and probably give up is really what, what happens a lot of the time. So just try to keep things as simple as you can when you're starting out and um, don't put anything extra and just keep everything nice and uh, rectangular. Um, so I haven't heard any questions yet. Um, if there are any questions, feel free to chime in. Um, I know it's probably a lot to absorb, but uh, hopefully that's okay. Um, the other thing you should keep in mind with R and any data analysis when you're reading it in is that there's kind of two, two broad shapes that you can keep your data in. One is often called long format data, where we might have something um, uh, where we have our observations, each one being a separate row. Um, and then we have the unique combinations that sort of um, characterize that observation in different rows here. So here we have one column for whatever value we were reading out, and then the combinations of donors and markers sort of say which um, value, uh, which treatment that value came from. So this would be called long format data, and this is because you know, lining everything up uniquely this way tends to make it really long down the page. The other way you could do this is if you had your marker A, B, and C, like we have over here, let's say, okay, we're gonna put that um, in a new column for each one, and then we can keep them, you know, separate based on which donor they are here. And so now we've suddenly got what's called wide format data. So we have exactly the same data here, but they're, they're totally different formats. And um, R will see them differently. Any computer program will see them differently. Like, I think if you're using like Prism or something, you typically want this wide format data. If you want to make like a heat map or something where you want a matrix to go in, this might be really useful because it's going to just correspond to the cells of your heat map. But in general, um, if you want to do any statistics, you're going to need your data in this format here. So there's lots of ways to convert between the two, so don't get too hung up on this, but do keep in mind, like if you're being really confused by things and being like, well, why is R not seeing my data? Like I think it should. It may just be that you have it in uh, the wide format when it should be in the long format or vice versa. And so there's lots of packages that help you deal with this. So this is just an example I just pulled from the tidy R package documentation. So where it's calling our wide format, basically messy data um, here. And you can see this is exactly what I just illustrated um, where we have the different observations um, in different columns versus here, we just have a single time column and then this key column and the treatment, the combination of them tell us the important things we need to know. So again, this is just something you, when you're starting out, I think it's, it's good to be aware of so that, um, you know, if you do run into trouble, you keep in mind that R might be looking for this type of format when you're giving it this format or vice versa. And I would say definitely if you're doing stats, this longer format is, is really the default. And it's only really when you're doing things like, um, you know, heat maps or maybe gene expression studies will sometimes want this type of format where you would have like genes by patients or something. Okay. Um, so that's just like, sort of the bare bones overview I'm going to give before um, we we go to R a little bit here. If, if there's time, I'll have to look at the time. Um, yeah, I think we still have a, bit, a few minutes here. Um, but in terms of troubleshooting, because things won't always work um, when you're doing this, and often when you start, most of the time they probably won't work. You're just going to get like a series of error messages as you kind of fumble your way through this. Um, and so again, like expect that and be patient with yourself because I think the payoff of getting through that is well worth the experience. Um, but do make sure like when you get an error message, you actually read it because it actually took me a really long time to, to realize that the fastest way to figure out how to fix an error is to actually like read what the message is telling me. Like I had this tendency, I know a lot of people do when they first see an error message, they just kind of freeze up and are, are like, oh, um, I'm panicked, like it didn't work. But if you actually read it, um, that's, that's uh, really the most important thing to do. Although granted in R, sometimes the error messages aren't, are very opaque, so it can be hard to tell. But then um, you can always ask for help. So maybe there's somebody around who knows R better than you do who can help you. Um, maybe you can just Google that error message. And then you can, if you really need help, you could go on to some place like Stack Overflow, which has an enormous sort of R um, set of help questions, question and answer kind of help topics. Um, so you could try to pose it as a question on Stack Overflow. Um, I think Stack Overflow is a great resource. If you guys aren't familiar with it, um, there's a link to it at the end of my presentation as well. But do keep in mind that, that a lot of people on there are like um, sort of this is their thing. It's like hanging out on Stack Overflow, asking questions. And you'll probably want to take some time and, and pose a careful question and just have a thick skin. Because if somebody tells you that, you know, you asked a terrible question and did it wrong, um, you know, that's 
probably not really a reflection on you, but just that this sort of a process that people like you to follow and just have a thick skin about it because sometimes um, people can be a bit a bit harsh on there. But overall, there's really helpful people um, and can often sort your problem out for you like right away, whereas you might spend a day or two banging your head against a wall otherwise. Okay, so let's take this into R for a little bit now um, so I can actually show you what some of this looks like in practice just briefly. Um, before I do that, I'll just show you the final slide, which is these links that will be posted. Um, so of course you need R if you're gonna do any of this. Like I said, I'd recommend R Studio. Stack Overflow um, has a very large R section. So this is the link to that. Um, so you can read other people's questions and you can ask your own if you have them. Um, there's an interesting guide called the R Inferno, which talks about uh, mistakes people make in R and how to get around them. I'd say this is a little more advanced. Um, so you might not want to start with this, but if, if you spend a couple months learning R and, and think you're kind of getting into it, this is kind of an entertaining read and I think it will improve your, your programming skills in R. Um, in terms of sort of general data management frameworks that um, people may want to use, there's something called the Tidyverse, which also is um, packaged by the makers of RStudio, which tries to sort of build like a very um, coherent and friendly syntax for doing a lot of R stuff. So I'd suggest you take a look here when you're getting started at, at the tidyverse commands, um, tidyverse functions, and just seeing how they would they would fit in with your workflow because I think it, this is good to learn. And there's also um, some packages that I think are really valuable if you're doing bigger data analysis. There's this one called Data Table, um, which is sort of um, does similar things to tidyverse. It's the syntax, so like how you do it is a little bit different. Um, but I think it's very powerful if you need to do like actual like real big data analysis in R. Um, Again, too, I think there were some questions about, you know, if R can interact easily with uh, like Microsoft Access databases. Um, I would say that's actually a bit a bit harder. I've, I've never tried to do that, um, but it's not a super common thing that I see people trying to do. More common, people will have like an SQL or SQL backend that they want to query, and Tidyverse has good functions for doing that. So that should be very straightforward. Um, if if you want to do some work with databases in R, this would be a good place to check out. Okay, so. I think we have um, about 15 minutes left. So I just have some short R scripts I'd go through with you guys. Um, and then hopefully there's some questions or maybe I've just uh, lost you all along the way. Um, so here's R Studio. Um, okay, so I wrote up a quick little script um, before we got started here. But I'm just gonna start a new one so you can see how this would look. So this is your R Studio window. Um, I've just opened it, but because I had these open when I quit before, they've come up again. Um, but here's our console here. Um, it should come up empty. I see I've run one command here while I was prepping for this. Um, so it tells you things like what version of R you have, um, which can be important. Uh, so definitely if you're publishing, you want to report what this version was. Um, and then up here's our script editor. So I can have comments. Uh, I can write down commands that I want to happen, and then I can just execute them in order. So right now, if I click up here, you'll see my cursor's flashing and I type, things show up there. Um, if I go down to the bottom of my console, I can also type. And so the difference being here in the top, if I write something, I'm just writing something down in basically a text editor to save it and nothing really gets executed till I tell it to execute. Down here, if I type something um, and I click enter, it runs it. So I typed X and hit enter and I haven't, named anything X yet, so it made an error just as we expect it should. Okay, so that's just a basic overview. So you just need to move your cursor down here. So let's see how that's flashing now if you want to type down here. And again, this is good for interactive programming. Um, or if you're writing a script, make sure your cursor's up here. Um, and you can hotkey it so you can go between them really quickly if you need to. So now that we have R open, we might want to start a little script. Um, so I'm just going to say a new file, R script. So I think it didn't quite work. I could use command as well. So I just get this empty script here. Um, so I could um, probably should write something like this script is, so I'm a, I'm a pretty bad typer. So um, apologized functionality. Um, I'm not gonna finish it right now because we're short on time, but, um, and then often, uh, what you might want to do at the top of your script is declare whatever packages you think you're going to use in this script. So um, I'm not going to install it right now, 
but I'm going to use one package um, that you guys may be familiar with or may have seen things from. So you can see here now I've started um, typing and our studio is conveniently looking for things that have the same name as what I've started. So I can just click tab now and it will finish it for me. So, you know, that's really handy because as I said before, some people will do this to name a name a function. So, and some people will do, whoops, this to name a function. And really it's a lot to remember at the end of the day. So if I can just start typing install and R tells me the one I'm probably looking for, that's really useful. So um, I'm not going to install any packages right now because that can take a little while. It's got to download stuff and it might install a bunch of dependencies. So it, it'll lock up my R for a little while, but I've already installed this one called ggplot2. So I, I'm going to use that a little bit um, in this. Um, and so to get access to those methods, I have to call it as a library and I can quote it here or not quote it. It doesn't really matter. If I'm going to install it, I have to quote it, um, but here it doesn't matter. So if I run that, um, so what I did here is I put my cursor on this command and then I basically hit this run command here. Um, only I hit command um, enter on a Mac to just run it as a shortcut. So that's why you didn't see anything. I've got my cursor here. I'm hitting command enter and it runs. So um, I'll try to hit this run button so you guys can see what happens. I think if you're using a PC like a Windows computer, then it might be like control enter or control R um, to run things. But that's the idea. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna need to do this is some data. So we can make an object, whatever we want. Um, I'll make one called B data because yesterday I was just putting uh, this little bit of code together and I just Googled free data. Um, and I ended up at this GitHub page that had um, these baseball stadium numbers. Oh, and I should also, for instance, save. So this is untitled script. I should make sure I save it as something. So. I'll just put it on, um, I'll just call this BioCanerx Scratch for now. Um, and that'll make an R script, so then it's all saved. So what I can do is that data on the internet was actually a CSV format. So I'm just gonna say the command read.csv. And again, you can see our studio is conveniently prompting me to finish it. Um, and then I'm just gonna paste in that web link. Um, although I must've put an extra quote in there because it's not seeing it. So I can actually use this function. I could have a CSV sheet on my computer somewhere. In that case, I quote it and I just put in the path on my computer to that file, or I can just put in a web link. And so I just put that and now I'm gonna click run to run that line. And you can see it got executed down here. And now I have something called bData in R. So if I just type it, it's gonna, it's gonna um, down here, it's gonna show me the whole thing, which probably doesn't mean that much. So it just started at the top and then it went down till R decided it, it showed me enough and didn't show me anymore. Hi, so, Finn, sorry, can I ask a question? Yeah, please do. All right, um, yeah, so I was just curious, You, I see you put in uh, like a link for an HTTPS there. Is that just yeah. directly from the website or did you have to download that no, onto this your- is, This is just reading it right off the internet right now. Oh, I see, okay, so yeah. it would have been something from the URL that you would have taken? Yeah, so I just went to GitHub and I found this data sheet and I just read it in straight from R. I didn't have to download it first. Oh, so okay, good to know. I yeah, can actually I was... go, go here yeah. if you want right now. Um, sure. And you'll see what it looks like here. Um, so this is the data sheet here. And there's lots of stuff like this out there on the internet. Um, and you can see it's actually comma separated, right? Because we're reading a CSV. So the commas mm -hmm. are splitting all the fields. Yeah, so it's just right there. Oh. Good to so, know. Thank you. Yeah, yeah no worries. Um, it's a good question. I, I didn't used to know that either, but I've been using it quite a bit recently. So um, so now we have a data set in R, and I don't have time to get too much into like the different classes of data that we see, um, but this actually imported this data set is to what R calls a data frame, um, which is similar to like just a spreadsheet. Basically, it's got some number of rows and some number of columns. So um, we can look at the top of it with like a function called head. So we can just type in run the function head on um, RB data, sorry. And it just shows the top of it. Um, we could run something like tail and this will show us the end of it. Um, and we might wanna know like what size the data is. So we could use something like dim. And again, all of these commands are like pretty random if you don't know them already, right? And this is where people get 
confused is they, you know, like they're like, how am I supposed to remember DIM? But all I can really tell you is that like, as you work through a data set of your own, like the first time this is gonna be hard and then the next time it's gonna be easier. And then, you know, a year later, you're gonna be like, oh, why did I ever not know how to do this? But it just, there's just a learning curve to remember all these things. So this will give us the dimensions of our data here. So it, it's um, saying there's 731 rows down here where it's writing everything out in the console times five columns. Um, so we could also look at n call for n the number of columns. So we get five or n row for number of column for the number of rows. So all the same information, just different ways of getting at it. Um, and then kind of the more advanced, I think, thing we could do with, with this thing we downloaded is look at its structure. So I was not sure I should show this to you guys, but it's kind of handy to wrap your um, your head around what's going on. So we can use str to show us the structure of something in R. And so if we put this data in there um, and we run this, um, it tells us what R is seeing about the data. And this can be useful because it helps us understand how we query different aspects of the data that we might want to. So this is saying that it's a data frame and we already knew it had 731 rows of five columns. And then it's got um, these different headings for team, year, state, stadium, and capacity. So maybe I should have been a bit more clear, but this is just random data that has like the different capacities of um, foot, uh, baseball stadiums in the US. So totally um, unrelated to anything we might wanna do, but I guess what part of my point is it really doesn't matter what we wanna do. Um, the methods are, are really the same. So, um, you can see it for each of the column names, it's got this dollar sign in front of it. And um, partly I'm showing you that because one way we can actually access columns within a data frame, and like for most things in, in R and in many languages, there's a whole bunch of different ways you can do any one thing. And this is nice because it's flexible, but it also really confuses people at the beginning. So we could look at B data and we can access the columns. So here I just started to put that dollar sign and now R Studio is helpfully showing me what different columns I can um, I can look at. So we know that um, we're looking at the capacity, um, or is, is probably the the sort of y value in this um, data frame that we're interested in. So let's say we want to look at that. But if I just type this, it's just going to give us a giant string of numbers, right? That's not really useful. But what I could do is say something like, you know, we might want to know its distribution of this. So maybe we want to just plot a histogram with base R really quickly. So we just say hist on that column and then lo and behold, we get a histogram over here. And um, so that's about the simplest thing we can do to start to plot this data. Um, yeah, so now we've got to the point where we've got a data sheet into R and I kind of shortcut it here because I went off the internet, but you can just give it a file path to something like a CSV on your computer and it should be equally easy. Um, file paths are a bit different between Mac and PC, but um, I think if you play around for a bit, you can figure it out and then we can we can look at our data, get a sense of you know how big it is, what its dimensions are and um, things like that. And then we can start to do things like make histograms, you know. Um, I'm just gonna pull up some of the other code I did getting this together. We have about five more minutes, so I don't wanna um, use all our time, but I think that um, a few more things are probably helpful to show you. So I'll just bring this over. So I'm just copying this off out of what I wrote yesterday. So to save a little time in typing. Um, so um, here we have our where I stopped before. So we could also run some basic R functions like we could do box plotting, um, which everybody wants to use. Um, and so we could say, let's box plot our capacity. Um, at, it's been R part of the formula interface. So Again, it's a little bit of jargon. You just have to learn um, and maybe confusing at first. But what this is saying is make a box plot of capacity looking within this B data data frame as a function of the different years that we have recorded. So we can just execute that. Um, so I just hit command enter and then it box plots it for us here. And so we have the years. Then we have basically all of the capacities aggregated across all of the different places we looked here in the box plot. So about as simple as you can get now. I talked a little bit about using ggplot too, so I just wanna show you how easy this is. And part of the reason I'm doing this is because you'll see these ggplot graphics in like thousands of papers now, and you, you might think, oh, that looks really snazzy. Um, it looks like it's hard to do. It's really not. Um, again, part of the problem with learning new packages is that 
everybody has the own, their own syntax they want to write. So what we can do here is we can say, once we've loaded the library ggplot, which I already did at the top, but I'll reload it. We can say ggplot, um, our data frame being bdata, and then we're going to say, let's put plot x on the year. Let's group it by year because it's a box plot. And then let's make our y variable capacity. And again, I don't expect you to follow this entirely right now if you've not done this before. And then let's add this box plotting layer over it. So if we do something like this, maybe these, this format of graphics looks familiar to you. Um, basically, it should be essentially the same as our base R version, just kind of a little bit snazzed up and we can modify it in any which way we might want. Um, so we could also look at this, maybe we want to look at something like, instead of looking across years, we want to look across states. Um, so I, all, I, all I need to do now is I can copy and paste this code down below and I can switch my X and my grouping to state instead of um, year. And now it's it's summarizing them by state. And so here's the plot it's given us. Um, and you can see down here, it's just jumbled everything up because the state names are too big to really fit on the plot. So this is where R kind of becomes a pain because you know we ran this first code really easily. And now to do something like spacing out these labels or rotating them, then we have to go Google around and figure out how to actually do that. So I'm not gonna do it right now. It's kind of a good, uh, case in point for how things you know start out easy and sort of can get harder as we want to customize them more and more and again this is the type of thing you'll have to do on your own data as you want, want to sort of make it more fit for publication but basically um here you know we're looking at this box plot of capacities by state um, which might be useful for something um, and the nice thing is now that we have this data in our format we can easily start to run stats on it um, and again, if you remember, if we go back here um, to look at the top of our data, we have what's called long format again. So, you know, we, we don't have a different column for every state or stadium or year. We have it all in one um, long, long format with just the Y variable here. So that's really um, amenable to doing stats. So say I wanted to run an analysis of variance, you know, to see if there's significant differences across states. And I said in the comments here, this is actually incorrect, um, but I'm gonna do it anyway, because I just wanna show you how easy it is. So I can just make this object I've called mod, sort for model, which is common R shorthand. And I'm just running this command saying, run an, an analysis of variance, AOV, of capacity as a function of state, and look within the B data for our data. So I did that, then I can summarize it, I get an ANOVA table by saying summary mod. I can do two key post hoc tests, which are all the pairwise comparisons um, here just by doing something like two key HSD. So I'm sorry if I'm losing you on these stats, but this is really just to show how easy it is once your data is in R to do basic stats on it. Um, but there's a problem with these stats we did. Um, I know this isn't really a stats lecture, but one of the assumptions of something like an ANOVA, which we just ran, is that our data are independent. And we already know that if we go back to here, that um, we collected data year after year. So probably, you know, connect, collecting the same data um, in 1990 and 1991, those are not independent data points. So we know something's fishy with this ANOVA we did. Uh, and so just kind of changing our plotting a little bit. So here we're gonna, instead of doing a box plot, we'll just do a, a point and line plot with ggplot. And then we can see things a little bit differently. So took a little while to render there. So for each team, what I've done, as I've said, we're gonna group it by team. Our Y variable is gonna be capacity. Our X variable is gonna be year. So we have X down here, Y here. We've grouped it by team and we've added the points and the lines corresponding to each team. So probably given our data set, this is a better summary of what's going on. And we can actually see that what capacity seems to be declining over time, but that's only for some teams that are really driving it. So already just by playing with our, um, plotting functions a little bit, we can um, get a little insight into what we might, might be going on here. Okay, so that's, I hope that wasn't too fast. Um, that's what I wanted to get through today. Um, so we've been about an hour now. Um, I'd like that's to open a question, up. Finn. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. It's been really helpful, Finn. This is really clear. Uh, just on the stats uh, portion of it, like I know something that I struggle with is this, if you have a new data set, not really knowing which statistical test to do early on and then yeah. where to find that for something like R, like what kind of resource would you recommend? Yeah, to, like, so that? I think it's important to recognize that R is not gonna tell you how to do statistics. It's just a tool. Um, 
And unfortunately, you kind of have to know you have to know how to analyze your data, um, whether you're doing this in Prism or R. Um, and it's great because there's a lot of help out there and you can read about it, but there's no great shortcut um, to just like learning that when you use a t-test, when you use an ANOVA. Um, yeah, I, I know that's not the best answer. I'd like to tell you that, oh, like our studio will pop up a genie and tell you you should do like a repeat measures ANOVA, but um, talk to a statistician if you're not sure. Um, take some stats courses if you wanna pursue this. Read, read some stats books, you know. Um, that's the type of thing you kind of have to do. Like ours at the end of the day is just a tool to do these. I think you have some questions in the chat, do you? Okay, sure. If, yeah, if there's a time um, with people, I'm happy to answer any. I don't see the chat box in my screen um, here, so. It's making uh, sure. Yeah, I don't. I think the one question um, was actually addressed. Okay. And so I think that's it for questions. So uh, if, if anyone does have questions and they'd prefer to write it, please do that. Uh, other, and I'll give it a minute or two for, for you guys to write those out. But um, as you're doing that, and, and Finn, I don't know if you have any last minute, res, um, not last minute results, last minute comments. Yeah, no, I think, um, you know, I, I know this has sort of covered a lot of ground pretty quickly. Um, and so I hope it was accessible to people. Um, I think the main thing I would just say is if, if you do want to learn R, just don't be scared of it because, um, you know, if you had just come in and started to try to read this code, um, you know, to me it looks very simple, but it, it might be sort of um, very complex to you, but that will get easier the more you do it. And, and just don't be scared of it and just dive in if, if it interests you and you will learn it. Mm -hmm. Great advice. Um, so no more questions came in. I think we can wrap up here. So again, I just really wanted to thank you. I think considering that was only an hour long webinar, I think that was an exceptionally good overview of R. Um, I think it was a good blend of technical advice and practical advice with respect, for instance, writing questions on forums. So again, I, I really wanna thank you for, for taking the time um, and for the participants still on the line, just a reminder that you can access, access this webinar on our website. It'll be posted within the week. And also just a reminder to please fill out the survey that uh, that I'll be emailing to you in the next day or so. So with that, um, thanks everyone for your participation. And Finn, thank you very much for, for delivering this webinar. Yeah, no, thanks you guys. Um, hope it was useful. Absolutely. Thanks. All right, okay. well, yeah, there. everyone have a great day. Bye now.